Welcome to our video, Japan and the World. The topic for this time is, Defining Ukraine's National Identity. I would like to focus on the The Eastern Front, AEI Podcasts. Hello and welcome to The Eastern Front. My name is Delbert Rohansh and I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm joined by my friends Giselle Donnelly, I'm also at AEI, and Julia Zoza with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown, and George Washington University. On our podcast, we talk about the challenges to European peace and security that have erupted along the line running from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. Our special guests today are Maria Popova, an Associate Professor of Political Science at McGill, and Oksana Chevelle associate professor of political science at Tufts, and they're both authors of Russia and Ukraine, Entangled Histories, Diverging States, which has come out on January 24th with Ruthi Press. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. Maria, Oksana, it's great to have you on the program. I have to say we haven't had a chance to read your book yet, but we are all three of us looking forward to taking a, a closer look, but just by reading the blurbs, reading the introductory chapter, which is available for free on Amazon website, one gets the sense that one could almost frame your work as a response of sorts to the infamous essay by Vladimir Putin, which came out a few months before the war, in which he argued that Russians and Ukrainians were historically the same people and therefore the effort to conquer Ukraine was a sort of natural culmination of the brotherhood between the two. I think we all with benefit of hindsight see that this is a nonsensical argument, but maybe you have you know more to say about that. But but first of all, why don't you just tell us a little bit about you know your book and, and, and what is the claim that you're trying to make and obviously started working on the book way before the invasion. What were the sort of primary sort of motivations for you as political scientists weighing on these on these questions? And what, what really sort of makes the book stand out? And what, what, what are the sort of new and different arguments that you make relative to what's already out there? Interestingly, we actually started working on this after the invasion. So, and we wrote it quite quickly. Uh, don't let my publisher hear that, please. Yes, we were all shocked. You shouldn't have said that on air. <laughs> this is undermining all of our work. <laughs> well, it was very, very intense. But we started writing it after the invasion. So it is, in a way, a response, yes, to Putin's essay, also to the argument made since 2014 by John Mearsheimer that this war is a result of NATO expansion. We really wanted to push back against both of those and explain that, in fact, it's the profound divergence between Russia and Ukraine over the last 30 years that set them on this collision course, which finally Russia decided to escalate to a full-scale invasion. But the roots of this, we explain in the book, are not NATO expansion. The roots are the divergence between Russia and Ukraine that started from the very moment, really, that the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991. I mean, divergence that is much deeper than 91 doesn't start from zero, but since 91 has really developed through this escalatory cycle that we talk about in the book, has developed to and has brought the two states to very different regime and identity positions. If I could just add on to this, sort of putting our professor's hats when we were thinking about this book, people who study political science, you know, comparative politics, agree on sort of two things that neither Putin nor uh, IR scholars, many of them, including Mearsheimer, seem to take into account. First of all, that domestic politics matters, that what happens, it's not just sort of countries and not these like uniform rational actors jumping around. And the account, you know, for example, this great power politics completely disregards domestic developments, disregards small countries altogether like Ukraine. Right. And then Putin's argument that sort of authentically um, or originally or God given or whichever way he thinks about it, Ukraine is part of Russia, is really, you know, again, if we think about it as scholars, is completely a theoretical argument because scholars who study nations and nationalism have shown with evidence across countries, across historical time periods, that the process of nation formation is a process. It happens uh, over a period of time. It happens under the influence of different factors. 
and people come to think of themselves as belonging to this or that nation as a result of these complex historical processes. So the, to claim that, you know, Russia is somehow like original authentic nation and Ukraine is somehow fake construction just doesn't make sense because both of these nations, as in most other nations, have been created over the course of centuries and people come to identify themselves with a certain nation. And that's a process that has been happening in Ukraine through history and, and continued through the 1990s. And also in Russia, sort of Russia after 1991, was trying to think how to think of themselves, of their nation in the post-Soviet period. And this divergence, or like one of these uh, types of divergences we talk about in the book, is how identity politics diverged, meaning that in Ukraine over time, more and more people came to think of themselves as belonging to a distinct Ukrainian nation and wanted to live in a separate, independent Ukrainian state. And in Russia, on the same time, these identity debates gradually produced a sort of strong imperial identity and this exactly rejection of the right of Ukraine in particular to be a separate nation and state. So that's sort of all part of the story that neither Putin's essay nor IR theorizing takes into account. Just, just very few questions. So one important part of this divergence seems to be a divergence of the two political systems. Right? So Ukraine's road to liberal democracy etc. has not been a sort of straight line, but that's the overall direction of travel. Whereas in Russia, what we've seen is the emergence of a you know, revanchist, autocratic state run by one person, essentially. So, so how do you explain this divergence at the level of political systems? Is it different historic legacies? Is it just accidents of the past 30 years? Is it uh, you know, different incentives facing relevant political actors in the two countries. You're right that the regime divergence is a big part of this story. And what we focus on is the interplay between Russia's attempt to meddle in Ukrainian domestic politics and how that shaped political competition within Ukraine, intensified political competition over time, and put Ukraine on a path, as you said, path that developed slowly Slowly and in fits and starts, there were some setbacks, but developed towards a competitive and uh, more democratic regime. And we start in the beginning of the 90s with the grand bargain, so-called, uh, within Ukrainian politics between a national right and a center that decide that they are both committed to independent Ukrainian statehood. And on the other hand, a left that is sort of more sympathetic to the pressure coming from Russia. And that interplay between these two groups maintains political competition, whereas in, in Russia things deteriorate very quickly and political competition di disappears very quickly. But the really crucial points in the regime divergence between Russia and Ukraine are the Orange Revolution in 2005 and, of course, Euromaidan in 2013-14, when Ukraine not only defends its political competition and its democracy, but then sets on a path towards uh, building a better democracy, one that has more rule of law and starts attempting to curb corruption and move towards Europeanization. Can I just add on to, you know, I think they, obviously the regime divergence story is very important, but it's also intertwined with this identity story that we are saying, because, for example, both of these events, 2004 Orange Revolution and 2013-14 Euro Maidan, which was domestic outcome in Ukraine. So there were, you know, this long-going political competition, then it culminates in 2014 in this attempt to steal elections. It sort of unfolds. By the time we get to the 2004, there were also various changes within the Ukrainian society. And for example, the constituency that was kind of more, maybe we can say, Western-oriented became somewhat bigger than it was in the 90s. And then for combination of all of these events, essentially kind of pro-Western candidate wins in the end, right? And that's, again, something that is Ukrainian domestic political competition produced. But that's not how it's seen in Russia. In Russia, it is seen as a result of Western meddling. So that's, again, sort of this imperial lens through which Russia has viewed Ukraine from the very beginning. It basically leads to this interpretation of these events as not an authentic domestic political process in Ukraine, but as something that, you know, conniving foreign actors did against the interests of Russia. So again, sort of Ukraine is denied agency, it's distinct identity is denied agency, the fact that there is some sort of domestically driven process happened, and the same happens again in 2014. So again, sort of this is interpreted in Russia as a quote-unquote coup, Western sponsored, and so forth. So yeah, we spent quite a bit of time in the book on the importance of these two turning points, because they really put this escalatory cycle that we say has been going on since 1991, kind of at a new level at each of these turning points. I want to ask you to 
dig even a little bit deeper into these identity politics and to maybe venture on into an explanation into both countries in terms of the interplay of identity politics. We've seen over the last few months and particularly through this war, a number of articles and analyses, and I know that both of you are, are subscribing to them, but I'm wondering how you would nuance them or, or factor them in in your explanation. The first one being, to what extent has Russia Russia's, Moscow's, the Kremlin's, you name it, denial of Ukrainian agency with interference throughout time and now kind of leading to the full-scale invasion, but we have it in the context of, of course, 2013, 2014, and we have it in the context of the Orange Revolution in, you know, attempts to poison political leaders, etc., on a crescendo. So looking back now over the last three decades, roughly three decades of Ukrainian nation and in a process that you're describing, to what extent, not just in the full-scale invasion, but over time, has Russia's attempt to deny agency and to interfere amplified Ukrainian search for and fight for independence, sovereignty, Western orientation, the whole package? And then the other thing that we see much less analysis of, how has Ukraine struggle against Russia for the West, for its freedom and independence and sovereignty affected in your understanding Russian dynamics not necessarily trying to look into Putin's head because that's you know an effort that we're all attempting and failing at but rather to the extent that you know it's it's limited and only limited in possibility to what extent has this resonated or how do Russians overall respond to that in the back and forth with propaganda? In other words, has Putin managed to completely brainwash public opinion in Russia to not know anything anymore about Ukrainian nationhood and Ukrainian fight? Has he managed to overlap it entirely with what he's accusing Western agency and all of that? Or has the Ukrainian fight over the three decades culminating in the full-scale invasion, has that had, in your understanding, any impact in w- any way whatsoever on Russian public opinion? Okay, maybe I'll start with the first part of the question on Ukraine, and then we can take the second about Russian public opinion. So this first point that you made, um, this is definitely a big part of our story in the book, just as you put it, that the more Russia pushed on Ukraine to basically do whatever Russia wanted, the more sort of counter-reaction right, it produced within Ukraine. So in other words, that's exactly sort of this escalatory cycle that Russia pushed to bring Ukraine into the fold leads to resistance within Ukraine. And then in turn, that resistance leads Russia to push even more. And this process originally, if we're thinking sort of back to the 1990s, was really playing out more at the levels of the elites than at the public level. And really after 2014, that's when it also begins to affect, and especially after 2024, that's when it really begins to affect the public as well. So let me just very kind of briefly say what we argue in the book. So again, this notion that uh, when Soviet Union collapses, Ukrainian president at the time famously calls it civilized divorce. The idea was among the Ukrainian political class, especially this center-right coalition, informal coalition that de facto was sort of running the country through the 90s, was that we are going to strike our own way. Yes, we can cooperate with Russia on various aspects, you know, from economy to foreign policy, but as long as we are still sort of can pursue our sovereign affairs as a sovereign state. And that's something that was never quite fully accepted in Russia. So instead, the idea was that, yes, like Soviet Union collapse, it was sort of inevitable at the time, but that's potentially a new beginning. There will be some other way to have some sort of other form of political union, you know, not Soviet Union, but some something else. I mean, there were different ideas in Russia, anything from so-called liberal empire to some kind of Slavic commonwealth, you name it. The Russians, to achieve that, they have tried to push through the 1990s for a variety of policies, for example, things such as dual citizenship with Ukraine, that Ukrainian elites very strongly resisted. Also kind of common reading of history, common history that we book to emphasize this commonality and continuity of faith. So we see this, you know, even in that sort of a paradox for many observers, but I think we explain it in our book how it really made sense, that even Russian-speaking Ukrainian elites who came from the regions who themselves spoke Russian, like the second Ukrainian president is the case in point, resist these sorts of policies because they want 
want to rule an independent state. So again, sort of we see this kind of the more Russia tries, the more Ukrainian political class resists. And then by 2004, also the population, sort of, you know, some part of the population begins to catch on to this because the, the way Ukrainian public perceived it was really quite varied. If you think back to, say, even late Gorbachev period, the referendum on preservation of the Soviet Union in the spring of 1991, majority in Ukraine vote to preserve the Soviet Union with caveats. Then the coup happens. The Ukraine declares independence, and in December 91, 92% vote for succession from the Soviet Union. So there was really dramatic change of opinion over a really short time. Then, of course, economic crisis hits, and the hopes for sort of great prosperity that many people associate with independence don't pan out. And then, you know, a lot of people begin to think, well, maybe some sort of closer ties with Russia would actually bring economic prosperity. And that's when we have the sort of divided electorate. So some part of the population, especially the West and increasingly the center, wants to strike a separate and kind of more committed to sovereignty pro Western orientation, you name it. And then in the South and the East, it's a different set of perspectives. But that's also not set in stone, it's changes. And by the time Orange Revolution wins, and then, you know, Yushchenko era policies, we see that they're supported increasingly also by the center. So the center kind of shifts westward. And we show that also in the book, kind of, if we think of this divide within Ukraine, it's not working in Russia's favor. The more time goes by, the more people begin to associate themselves with Ukraine and separate paths and Europe and the West. So none of this Russia likes, right? And again, they interpret it as some sort of like fake preferences, Western meddling. And then to just sort of jump to more recent period when this exactly this question, if you're asking how it produced backlash in Ukraine, by the time invasion happens and after Russia annexed Crimea and was backing the separatist rebellion in eastern Donbass, people in the historical Russia friendly regions now support NATO, they support the EU. They have negative views of Russia. So all of these things that by themselves probably would have taken decades to get to, even if, you know, that part of Ukraine ever came to think about it. Putin's aggressive policy really turned, you know, he, he essentially turns Ukraine into this anti-Russia that he says that he is fighting that was created by the West. <laughs> it was not created by the West. It was created by his very policies. And I don't know, maybe Maria, you can talk about Russian public opinion. Yeah, it's very important how Russia got to this point where this war that it's now waging is fairly popular. And I think what we argue in the book is not so much that Putin came in and sort of started pushing this and, and brainwashed the Russian population, but really that there are much deeper roots for that imperial identity then in fact there was a, a very short opening in the 90s in which an alternative Russian identity conception could have developed where Russians could have started to break down their imperial identity which as we know is a long and hard process for all empires to let go truly of the idea that they're entitled to controlling all the former colonies and in Russia there was maybe this small window of opportunity in the 90s where if democratic or at least political competition of any sort had continued, maybe these alternative voices may have had the opportunity to push gradually towards Russians arriving at an identity conception which does not see Ukrainians as, as belonging to this triunity. But because democracy died, the imperial conception, which was already the default, became even stronger over time. And once Putin picked up that mantle and started uh, officially pushing it even more. It has become consolidated after the annexation of Crimea, which produced this enormous boost for him. Of course, this is now tested as a winning political strategy, reincorporating Ukraine. So the dynamics have strengthened it rather than sort of introduced it. I wonder if I could ask you kind of a faculty lounge question. Because it wasn't just the IR theorists, the Mearsheimers, the realists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who mistook the nature of the war and missed the character of the two national identities that we've been talking about. It was very much also the, you know, so-called regional experts, you know, the people who were supposed to be sensitive to such things. And in particular, you know, the, the excuse given for much of this was that the field is dominated by Russia, especially. It makes me, A, wish that your book had been published earlier prior to this invasion. But I'm wondering if you can explain, and this is not just a ivory tower question because it has had policy effects and implications, particularly in the United States, but I think 
throughout the West more broadly. And even today, I think people sort of give Putin and Russia more credit than they really have earned or deserve. And conversely, continue to downplay the strength of Ukrainian identity. So uh, two questions. First of all, do you think there's something to what I'm saying? And secondly, from your own experience, do you find that there's a more receptive audience for your work now than there might have been five years ago or prior to not only the invasion, but the strength of the Ukrainian resistance? Definitely. Let me maybe I'll start just briefly because I think it's exactly a very important point that you raise. Who are the voices talking about this region, right? And it has been the case for a long time, since certainly since 91, and in fact going back to the Soviet and probably even Tsarist period, that the specialists like on Russia, on, you know, Kremlinologists of the Soviet period and sort of Russia specialists in the post-Soviet period, and that goes both to academia and even more so to the media, because the journalists who are sort of based in Moscow, who studied Russian, you know, all of a sudden then decamp to these non-Russian regions and publish articles from there, and they are taken, you know, as experts, even though many of them don't really know much about these regions. And I think we've seen that with regard to Ukraine, for sure. And I think that led the invasion, really kind of led many people, maybe not a sufficient number of people, but certainly more people than before to really think about this, like who is telling the story, whose voices are heard and whose voices are silent, um, or kind of discounted as being, you know, too emotional, too, like, nationalist. And there has been a lot of conversation in academic fields about this, sort of broader speaking decolonization of the Slavic studies. I mean, to the credit of many of our colleagues, I mean, people do talk about it, and there is acknowledgement of these things. I mean, just to give you sort of obvious example, for example, somebody is like, if an American studies American politics, they are not going to be assumed to be biased because they're American, right, or nationalist because they're American or Canadian you know, French studying France. But that's how it has been for people studying scholars from the region, studying non, non-Russian regions. You know, I'm from Ukraine myself, and I can tell you how many times, sort of implicitly or explicitly, it was sort of like I was led to understand that, like, whatever I may say about Ukraine has to be kind of taken with a grain of salt, because after all, you know, I'm from there, I can't really be objective, right? But that's not the perception that, say, scholars of France or Canada or U.S. or any other country had to deal with. So there is a certain realization of this, and then another side to it that if, say, even scholars from the region are invited, they're more invited to give, like, local perspective instead of academic analysis. And many of our colleagues complained about this. They would be even called, like, on CNN or something. And a Western expert, right, or, you know, Russia expert sometimes would be sort of giving the analysis and then they would give all like local perspective how do people feel about it, right? So I think that these sorts of biases really came out in the open and I think it's a process so we are not definitely at the end of this process but at least, you know, if there is some silver lining for academia from this terrible war, I mean that these the conversations are now happening in earnest, you know, scholars, scholarly associations are thinking about it and hopefully there will be changes. If I can follow up on this to both of you as questions, uh, Giselle kind of already opened up something that I wanted to touch upon, but I'd love to hear a little bit more on that because you both are originally from Central Eastern Europe, so are two of three of us here, and you both work in universities. And so I'm wondering, through both of your perspectives, you Oksana just mentioned it's a process, very kindly, but, but I'm wondering how you would describe also how your book is being accepted or, or responded to in the U.S. academic environment, but to what extent universities in the United States and Western Europe, but primarily in the United States, have or have not changed their approach, um, not just at the individual faculty member level, but also in how we are studying and how we are titling our courses, how we're looking at Soviet times, analyzing um, history but also contemporary because and I'll maybe lead the witness but I'd love to hear you deferring on this or opposing me I would have hoped in the context of the full-scale invasion that more of an overhaul would have taken place that there would be more positions open for Central Eastern European studies Central Eastern European perspectives on post-Soviet studies, on European affairs at large, on you name it. And a little has happened, but I do hear complaints from students and from colleagues around the United States that they continue to hear people teaching that, for instance, Ukraine and Russia are brotherly nations and shouldn't be fighting. That, And you name the cliches that we can get out of Putin's mouth or or someone in that post-Soviet or Soviet thinking. 
work. So how do you, from your perspective, without obviously naming names and naming faculty or, or universities, how do you see this environment having changed or not have changed over the last couple of years? And what are you... I guess, expecting or looking at in the coming months and years? Do you think we're coming to a head in these processes and changes? Or do you think that this is a long fight and we're in for the duration? This is a really good question and it will be a long process. That's for sure. But I think some steps are being made mainly because there's been a mobilization, I think, among scholars studying these smaller nations to push harder. And some uh, willingness among the Russianists to start listening. But it's going to be a long road, for sure, because there are so many things which seem like small steps which are hard to take. One, as you mentioned, the war should have led to a galvanization and more hiring in East Central Europe, but instead I think it is leading to more Russian jobs. I saw some people saying that there are a lot of jobs for Russianists because we want to understand the war. <laughs> There's also things like pushback by scholars who want to remove Russia from the names of centers using arguments such as, for example, why do we need a center for Russian, Eastern European and Eurasian studies? Why is Russia the only country individually named in that title, instead of just saying broader Eastern European and Eurasian. And there are a lot of arguments by Russianists that, well, no, Russia is somehow still more important, so it is not okay to take it out of the title. So small fights like that, I think, are happening all over the place. And how they turn out, I think, depends a lot on how momentum will be sustained, but it also depends on, in part, unfortunately, I think on how the war is going to continue, because if Russia somehow manages to prevail or to force some kind of settlement, it will continue trying to uh, push its narratives and its biases onto the information space even here in the West. So it will require really sustained pushback over a long time. Yeah, I'll I echo what Maria is saying, just to emphasize again that these sort of many small fights, I think that's how it's going to be taking place, in part because Western education in the U.S. in particular and North America is very decentralized. There is no like Ministry of Education that's going to do like a new curriculum for the whole country, right? So it's really up to individual universities to say, okay, we are going to do things differently. So I think university leadership is important, leadership of these research centers is important, and individual faculty that is sympathetic to this decolonization, which is now the theme, but that's another sort of thing, right? The, the notion that Russia is actually a colonial and imperial power as opposed to anti-colonial still doesn't sit well with many, right? Because, of course, it sort of casts itself as an anti-colonial force in the developing world in particular, but it simultaneously it was, in many respects, colonial toward, you know, its neighborhood and some say even within Russia, right? All of these smaller non-Russian groups within Russia. So that's sort of this whole big, uh, you know, field and many conversations going in there. But that's also, I would say, that, you know, books in this sense are important because I think the more are the available textbooks for Russian language learners where the chapters would actually be written from kind of decolonial perspective. So it's a language text, but the message, you know, the students will be reading will not be about how Dostoevsky was a great writer, but it was like how was Russia interfering in the Maidan, right? And then, you know, again, whoever is sympathetic, the scholar, they can adopt that text. So I think this, what Maria was saying, that sort of many small fights going on in many places simultaneously, it's frustrating, but I think that's how change would have to come, given how decentralized the system is and how much academic freedom both individual faculty and departments and universities have. So there won't be sort of like a top-down directive where it's going to change everything. To return us back from the world of academia to actual Eastern Europe, I want to pick up on, on something that Maria alluded to, namely that a lot hinges on how this war ends. And that's obviously true for, for the world of universities and academic departments, but it's even more true of, of Ukraine and, and Russia. And you said earlier that in the 1990s there was a brief window of opportunity for Russia to adopt a sort of non-imperial, pluralistic, democratic, national identity. And I wonder if you would 
be willing to suggest that if Russia emerges out of, out of this war chastised and uh, defeated, there might be once again a window opportunity for democratization and for a sort of alternative path for Russia. Or whether that's a sort of question you are not contemplating. Yeah. Well, what I'm hearing from many Ukrainians is that like, you know, we don't really have any control over Russia, we don't want to have anything to do with them, we want to have our own path. Let's let's ignore what's happening. You know how how Russians sort of settle their own affairs after after this war. But if there's anything that sort of struck you during you know your work on this book or in your research more broadly, that that would have any sort of insights about Russia's internal dynamics after what we all hope will be a defeat for this regime in Ukraine. Oh, let's just defeat him and give it a chance. What we argue in the conclusion of the book is that even if Russia is defeated in Ukraine and in the sense of it's forced to pull out, it cannot sustain this war, it has to abandon Ukraine. What we argue is that this is not the end of Russia's designs on Ukraine. And so the West and Ukraine will have to continue deterring Russia for as long as it takes until this identity conception change happens and regime change happens in Russia. But we specifically argue that this will have to be a Russia-initiated process. It will have to be something that comes out of Russian society. We don't really see very strong kernels of it for now, but really the only way that this can happen, we argue, is through an internal process in Russia, and there is no way for it to start unless they get defeated, unless there is a clear break which shows them that this expansionist identity is really bad for them. Defeat on the battlefield is good for imperial self-reflection. That's for sure. Before we wrap up, I'd like to introduce one related topic. No one can really doubt the strength of Ukrainian identity and national feeling at this point. But the question is, where does Ukraine stand as a state? In order to secure its national aspirations, it clearly needs to get some help, but also, and I don't mean just in the sense of rooting out corruption, but in the sense of building institutional structures that can give voice to and sustain Ukrainian independence and national identity. Where do you think that Kiev is in this process, and what is the thing that most needs to be done to translate the spirit into a true regime. Yeah, well, maybe I'll start. I mean, the fact that Ukraine is now EU candidate member, I mean, it's hugely important because if we think about sort of the impetus for domestic reforms, many of them are very difficult, do not benefit oftentimes the ruling class. There is, you know, resistance to, say, anti-corruption reforms and so forth. That was the case across all the EU accession states. And there is civil society in Ukraine, very vibrant, you know, arguably maybe even more developed than, say, civil society was in uh, some countries that were joining the EU earlier. But again, they can only do sort of so much, especially if there is no clear carrot at the end, right? Like, okay, we're going to do these reforms, we're going to root, and, and what for, right? Like, we're still not getting in. So I think the fact that now there is a clear path to EU membership is huge if we sort of think kind of medium to long term, because it now gives, you know, the incentive, it's sort of the boost, and there is, you know, plenty of research on that in political science, kind of this domestic and international pressures reinforcing each other and producing, you know, these more desirable outcomes. So in that sense, that's very important. Now, of course, sort of being the country at war, being, you know, devastated on a daily basis from the Russian missile attack, out migration from Ukraine, destroyed, you know, infrastructure, business. I mean, all of these are huge problems. So the more the war goes on, sort of the more challenges the Ukraine has to deal with. So in that sense, of course, the war ending quicker, Ukrainian victory would be much better than it doesn't. But at the same time, I also want to emphasize that I think the resilience in the Ukrainian society and kind of adaptability of the state is really quite impressive. I mean, if we think about anything from the grain corridor that I just read a few days ago, that the amount of grain apparently transferred is back to before Russia pulled out. I mean, that's quite impressive, right? The industry has been retooling. I mean, there is a lot of, you know, Ukraine cannot quite match all this three U.S. military support still remains crucial, but they're now producing more and sort of it seems to be an effort to produce for the defense. So these sorts of things, right, like in towns that are being bombed, uh, coffee shops are open and people can get caramel latte. Like this is sort of seems like where so this resilience is really, it's, it's quite a, remarkable if you think about it, right? So it's sort of like, again, I don't want to sort of paint too rosy picture that Ukraine is going to do great no matter what, because obviously, you know, if Russia continues to devastate the infrastructure and if the Western U.S. military aid is not forthcoming, I mean, it will have great consequences. But the 
think we sort of have to, you know, also look at beyond just the headline or like some village has fallen or, you know, some arms didn't come in and kind of see what else is going on in the country. And there are, you know, Maria can speak about very impressive anti-corruption reforms that have been going on despite all of this. I mean, there is, of course, a challenge what to do with the elections because Zelensky's term is running out, right? Sort of democracy runs elections, but you can't really run elections when part of your country is occupied. So all of these things are the kind of challenges Ukraine would have to deal with. But I would emphasize that EU membership, I think, is hugely, hugely important and that's what Ukrainians ultimately went to Euromaidan for back in 2013, right? And then this adaptability and the resilience, which I think sometimes get underappreciated uh, in the West and still really not well understood even by scholars. Like sort of the sources of it, the dynamics of it, I think is something to keep in mind. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I'll just add super briefly that EU membership is indeed the main carrot here. And indeed, the Ukrainian state achieved several reforms much quicker than the previous candidates had achieved them because the incentive is so significant. And so when the when the European Commission recommended starting negotiation, it recommended it on not on some aspirational ideas, but on the basis of what the Ukrainian state has done in the last year. And that was very impressive. Oksana Shevel, Maria Popova, thank you so much. The book is called Russia and Ukraine, Entangled Histories, Diverging States. It was a great pleasure to have you on the podcast. From me, Dalva Rohaj. And me, Giselle Donnelly. And Julia Zoza. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Front, a podcast dedicated to security challenges that have erupted along the line running from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, AI.org, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please do get in touch with us on the platform formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag Eastern Front Pod, written as one word, And don't forget to sign up for the Eastern Front's newsletter through the link included in the show notes to receive more content from the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating and reviewing us. Thank you and goodbye.